About 70 migrants from Central American countries were detained by the Mexican immigration agents in the southeastern state of Veracruz. Russia's Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave his annual press conference on the country's diplomacy in 2021. The foreign ministers of China and Iran met to assess bilateral relations. From the headquarters of Telesur English in Havana, Cuba, this is from the south. I'm your anchor, Gladys Quesada, and these are the news. About 70 migrants from Central American countries were detained by Mexican immigration agents in the southeastern state of Veracruz. According to the Mexican National Migration Institute, the migrants were found on the Cordoba-Veracruz Federal Highway during a routine check by authorities. The government agency explained that these citizens were traveling in overcrowded conditions and showed signs of violence. The asylum seekers were also traveling illegally as they lacked the, the documents required by the country to circulate within the territory. The data presented by the Migration Policy Unit revealed that currently more than 252,000 migrants have been intercepted by the government between January and November 2021. On Thursday, several Haitian citizens staged a protest in the capital of Mexico, demanding the regularization of their situation in that Central American country. This was the third mobilization before the Mexican Commission for Refugees, in which tense scenes were experienced when a police line was set up between the headquarters of the organization and the migrants. Demonstrators have demanded on several occasions the delivery of documents that legalize their stay in Mexico and thus be able to aspire to job efforts that allow them to meet the expenses they have faced throughout the journey and other aspects related to the right of every human being to a dignified life. Mexico has accepted more than 200 152,000 migrants between January and November 2021. In that same period, it also deported another 100,000. Haitians, we came here to get papers. We have no papers. Without papers, we can do anything. We have to eat. We have to pay rent. We have to support our family in Haiti. If things were fine in Haiti, we wouldn't be here. So we came here for a reason. We need papers. We crossed 11 countries to get here. We spent a lot of money to come here. We didn't come here to play. We came here for a reason, so we need papers. We are not going to live without papers. On Thursday, leaders of the Commission of Secretariats of the Central American Integration System, SICA, and the pro-temporary presidency of that organization held their first meeting in Panama to coordinate national agendas and articulate a regional program. As part of the meeting, the intersectoral agenda was developed in the areas of democratic security, climate change, social and economic integration, as well as measures for institutional strengthening. During her speech, the Director of Economic Relations of the Foreign Ministry, Carla Ramirez, also reiterated that Panama will carefully fulfill its missions in the pro-temporary presidency under the leadership of Panamanian President Laurentino Cortizo Cohen and the Foreign Minister Erika Moniz. The next meeting is expected to be held on January 26 with the foreign policy directors under the new pro-temporary presidency. On Thursday, the government of President Nayib Bukele denied any link with the Pegasus spying program. Several organizations and journalists for the Central American nation have denounced that the government of El Salvador has used the Israeli software to monitor journalists and human rights activists. The Secretary of Communications of El Salvador, Sofia Medina, denied links between the governments and the Pegasus or any developer of the program. In this way, the official was responding on behalf of the government to the report prepared by the University of Toronto and verified by several international human rights organizations that claim that the program has been used against journalists and members of civil society organizations. However, the Secretary of Communications reaffirmed that the government has neither resources nor licenses to use this type of software. Costa Rica's parliament on Thursday approved the legislation, the legalization, I beg your pardon, of the cultivation, production, industrialization, and commercialization of hemp and medical cannabis after three years of discussion of the bill.
The lawmaker who promoted the bill, Soy Lavolio, welcomed the move, claiming that it will generate investment, employment, and economic growth. But this, she stressed that the most important thing was that chronically ill patients will be able to get a quality medicine at a reasonable price in order to have quality of life. Volio submitted the proposal at the beginning of 2019. However, obstacles in the Legislative Assembly with a group of members against it and later in the executive branch, which did not recognize and prioritize it as an urgency, meant that the time passed with little progress made. According to the legislation, the Ministry of Agriculture will regulate the hemp market and the Ministry of Health will regulate the medical and third-party cannabis market. And now, at this time, we focus on news interests on the border between Chile and Bolivia, as new measures against COVID-19 imposed by the Chilean government, which keep 100 international cargo trucks stranded at the Chungara Tambo Quemado border cost Bolivia almost $10 million a day. This was announced by the Vice Minister of Foreign Trade and Integration of Bolivia, Benjamin Blanco, who went to the border point between the two countries, where he referred to the daily economic losses associated with the situation. The Bolivian official said that the carriers have a deadline to return the containers, and if the period is succeeded, they must assume the cost of the delay. Adding that the economic damage affects everyone equally, Blanco said that he was already in talks with the Chilean government, assuring that there is encouragement from the counterpart to generate solutions. We have had a meeting with Chile where we have found great willingness and we have seen that there are some possibilities to speed up in a short term the passage of transport. One of the methods that has been agreed upon is the early registration with the support of our National Guard of Bolivia. And Lawrence Diloy, the son of the former presidential candidate Ingrid Betancourt, won an important victory against the Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia's People's Army before the courts of the United States. This happened after a federal judge in New Jersey ordered FARC to pay Diloy $36 million in restitution for the kidnapping of his mother between 2002 and 2008. Ingrid's son filed a lawsuit in 2018 alleging that the group had violated the Anti-Terrorist Act, which allows victims of this scourge to bring charges before courts of justice in the U.S. looking for compensation. The lawsuit alleged that Betancourt's kidnapping caused Deloy sever severe emotional distress. A week ago, Judge Matthew Brand concluded that the lawyers had been able to prove that Deloy was sheltered by the ATA and that the FARC were responsible for his ordeal. And we'll be right back after this very short break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From the South. Venezuela's National Assembly drafted a report on the crimes committed by former right-wing deputies between 2015 to 2020. The announcement was made by the President of the Parliament, Jorge Rodriguez, during a meeting with the President, Nicolás Maduro Moros, where the guidelines for the next legislative period were delivered. The government official explained that a special commission was created to present the report about the serious crimes committed by corrupt former deputies who betrayed the country and promoted aggressions against Venezuelans. It is little said what we found there, President Maduro a legislative power in an extreme state of decay, from the floor plan to the development of the work that went on there. In fact, a special commission was appointed, and in a few days, they will render the correspondent report about serious crimes that from the legislative house were committed, from the house of laws, from the house of the accompaniment of the state of Venezuela to the Venezuelan people. The greatest aggressions were committed against the normal functioning of the republic and above all against the people of Venezuela. From that place, situations were promoted that could have been catastrophic, such as requests for the invasion of the Republic, armed clashes, economic blockades against Venezuela, financial blockades, and the implementation of sanctions to attack the daily life of the Venezuelan people. From that same place, an attempt was made to set up a false government that does not comply with any of the principles that the states have to establish that a government exists the control of the territory over the armed forces. 
Now we continue. Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov gave his annual press conference on the country's diplomacy in 2021. The event was held in a hybrid format with questions to the diplomat asked online and in person. The Russian minister began his speech referring to the recent negotiations between his country and the West of the country, guarantees in Europe, and announced that Moscow is waiting for written answers from Washington and the North Atlantic Treaty Organization on his country's proposals. The senior official reiterated they believe in goodwill and compromise to find acceptable solutions. In the same way, he assured tensions between his country and NATO had piled up and Russia's patience has run out. NATO, over five ways of expansion, came right up to our borders. Everybody realizes that the possibility of reaching an agreement depends on the U.S. No matter what we are being told about the need to consult their allies, involve all OSCE members in the process, these are all excuses and attempts to drag out the process. They demand from us that on our territory, we send our forces back to the barracks. Meanwhile, the U.S., Canadians, English are virtually on a permanent basis camped. Ukraine reported on Friday that it was the victim of a massive cyber attack that affected several government websites, including those of the Cabinet of Ministers, the Ministries of Foreign Affairs, Emergency Affairs and other ministries. Hours later, the European Union assured that it will mobilize all its resources to support Ukraine in the face of the cyber attack. The Foreign Ministry website earlier Friday displayed a message in Ukrainian, Russian and Polish, warning Ukrainians that their personal data had been compromised. All information about you has become public. Be afraid and expect the worst, the message read. Within hours of the initial announcement, the security services said access to most sites had been restored and that the fallout was minimal according to the initial estimate. The U.S. High Representative for Foreign Affairs, Joseph Borrell, regret the incident. And the troops belonging to a Russian-led security alliance began to pull out of Kazakhstan on Friday, only a week after they were deployed to the ex-Soviet nation. The Russian troops were sent on the request of the president of the Kazakhstan region, who was seeking to kill violent mass protests. Demonstrations started on January 2nd in western Kazakhstan, following widespread outrage over a sharp rise in fuel prices. They quickly spread nationwide, descending into violence and chaos within several days. Protesters stormed government buildings and set them ablaze, and dozens were killed in clashes with this country's security forces. On Friday, Russian Defense Ministry released video footage showing showing pull-out of equipment and peacekeeping contingents of Russia, Armenia, Belarus and Tajikistan. According to the Russian Defense Ministry, the pull-out is planned to be completed by January 19th. Now we address other topics. Cambodia on Friday began a fourth round of vaccinations against coronavirus following the recent discovery of cases of the Omicron variant, with high-risk groups being the first to receive their next shots. Among those waiting at the hospitals and clinics were frontline medical staff, as well as members of the armed forces. Hansen has appealed to all Cambodians to get fully vaccinated, including a booster, saying that is the only way to make sure to keep their families and communities safe from COVID-19. Cambodia reopened its borders to fully vaccinated travelers on November 15th, two weeks earlier than originally planned, in a move aimed at revitalizing the country's economic and social activity. Restrictions on domestic tourism, schools and other sectors were also lifted at the start of the month. As of Friday, Cambodia's total stood at 120,718 cases and also 3,015 deaths linked to the virus since the pandemic began. has imposed a two-week nighttime curfew on the citizens as new cases of COVID-19 keep rising.
The government action was informed by recommendations from the Scientific Council and also puts on hold all public gatherings or events. The measures will be enforced for an renewable period of two weeks. Throughout this period, the administration intends to intensify vaccination and ensure that the population receives booster doses. Health controls at the borders will also be strengthened with systematic tests on people entering the country and recommendation not to travel to the most contaminated areas in the nation. Australia's government cancelled Novak Djokovic visits for the second time on Friday. Immigration Minister Alex Hawkey said he acted on the health and good order grounds. Prime Minister Scott Morrison's government is firmly committed to protecting Australia's borders, particularly in relation to the COVID-19 pandemic, Hawkey said in a statement. The cancellation effectively means Djokovic will be barred from new Australian visa for three years, except under certain circumstances. The visa decision put the Serbian world number one's dream of a 10th Australian Open title and a record 21st Grand Slam in peril. Djokovic is the tournament's top seed and had been practicing on the Melbourne Park courts in a few hours later. The megastar mega flew into Melbourne Airport on January 5th, claiming a vaccine exemption because of a positive PCR test result on December 16th. And we have more stories coming up after this final short break, so stay with us. Welcome back. The foreign ministers of China and Iran met to assess bilateral relations. The meeting between Chinese Chancellor Wang Yi and his Iranian counterpart Hossein Amir Abdullah Hayan takes place within the framework of the visit of the Persian diplomat to the Asian giant. In this meeting, the governments of Beijing and Tehran bet on deepening the comprehensive strategic agreement as well as cooperation in all sectors with the purpose of facing the U.S. aggressions. The visit of the Iranian foreign minister to China takes place in the middle of the talks being held in Vienna to rescue the nuclear agreement signed in 2015 between the Iranian government and the West Western powers. A few hours after the North Korean government responded to the U.S. sanctions, saying it will have to take stricter measures to enforce its rights, the South Korea Joint Chiefs of Staff said it had recorded the launch of another unidentified projectile. The Japanese Coast Guard also warned at 14.55 local time of an alleged ballistic missile launched from North Korea, advising vessels in the area to exercise caution in the case they observe any object falling into the water. Hours before the reports issued by the Japanese and South Korean authorities, a spokesperson for the North Korean Ministry of Foreign Affairs defended the recent launches of alleged hypersonic missiles as a just exercise of self-defense, thus responding to the sanctions applied by Washington, which he described as a hostile and aim at suffocating and isolating the country. On Friday, Indian bomb disposal experts cordoned off a busy flower market in the capital, New Delhi, after finding an improvised explosive device left in an abandoned bag, according to police. Police Commissioner Rakesh Hashtana said that the bag was left behind by a customer who visited a shop to buy flowers at the Ghazipur wholesale flower market. Ashtana said that the market is under a police cordon and that everything that was inside the bag is under investigation. The market in eastern Delhi gets crowded daily with thousands of small flowers, fl fr former flowers, horticulturists and shopkeepers. India is in heightened state of security ahead of Republic Day celebrations on January 26, when a military parade is due to take place in the heart of the capital. Now we address other topics. Indonesia's meteorology agency reported on Friday a powerful 6.6 .6 magnitude quake, strongly felt in Java Island and the capital Jakarta. 
The meteorology agency said that the earthquake hit 52 kilometers off Banten province at a depth of 10 kilometers, but did not trigger a tsunami warning. There were no immediate reports of casualties, and according to some witnesses in Yukata, tremors were felt strongly for more than a minute. The quake was also felt in the provinces of West Java and Lampun on Sumatra Island. Last month, a 7.4 magnitude earthquake struck the country's east, triggering a tsunami warning and also sending residents fleeing from their homes but causing only minor damage. And the Nisha stands over the so-called Pacific Ring of Fire, a highly seismically active zone where different plates of the Earth's crust meet and create a large number of earthquakes and volcanoes. Two people were killed and 10 others were injured after a fire broke out on Friday, as a gas liquefaction unit in Kuwait's largest refinery, the plant's operator said. According to a tweet from the state-owned Kuwait National Petroleum Company, the blaze erupted during maintenance work. On the unit at Min al Madadi refinery, 40 kilometers south of Kuwait City. The company stated that out of the 12 people injured by the accident, seven were hospitalized and five of them in critical condition. KNPZ said Kuwait's refining operations and exports were unaffected as the unit affected had already been out of service. Maina al Mari, where another fire last October caused a number of light injuries, is the largest of Kuwait's three refineries and handles about 466,000 oil barrels per day. And the temperatures at Onslow Airport in Western Australia have hit a staggering 50.7 degrees Celsius, the state's hottest day on record and the equal hottest ever in the country. According to the state's Bureau of Meteorology, the country last recorded a temperature of 50.7 degrees Celsius on January 2nd, 1960 at South Australia's Odnara Airport. The country's Climate Council warns that such temperatures could become commonplace in Australia due to global warming. It is well known that heat waves are the silent killer in the nation, causing more deaths than any other extreme weather events. The heat was felt across Western Australia, including the town of Roarborn, some 230 kilometers east of slow. And we have come to the end of this news brief. But remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at tellusoryenglish.net. And also, if you feel so inclined, please join us on social media for all the latest news. We are on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Tellusory English, I'm Gladys Quesada. Thank you for watching.